Good evening. Turn in your Bible to Luke chapter 23. We're going to hear three words from the cross, three words of our Lord Jesus. There are seven words recorded in the four gospels that our Lord spoke from the cross. And call me lazy, but we're gonna cover three of them tonight. They'll be there for you to ponder, and you'll be glad that I didn't cover all seven so that you could go home and go to bed. The first word is a word of forgiveness. Luke 23, verse 34. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Let's pray. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Lord, you are our rock and our redeemer. So we ask you with confidence in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. You know, they knew what they were doing. They falsely accused him. They mocked him. They beat him. No evidence was produced to substantiate any of the claims, and yet he was sent to be crucified. But first, robed, dressed up all fancy just to make fun of him. Then they stripped him, nailed him to a cross, hands and feet, and then he was dropped into the ground in between criminals. They knew what they were doing, but at the same time, they had no idea what they were doing. Not a clue. Because you see, they thought they were right about Jesus. They thought he was a phony, a farce, and worse, a danger to his people. They, they thought his claim to be Messiah was blasphemy let alone his claim to be one with the Father? Are you kidding me? And then you have the way that he loved foreigners, even Romans. He associates with women and unclean people. And then he's, he's walking around in poverty, seemingly powerless in the eyes of the world. This isn't anything that we're interested in for a Messiah. <laughs> you don't fit the profile, Jesus. And so, in their minds, they crucified a rogue, a rebel, a radical, a problem. When in fact, they were crucifying the Son of Man who came to forgive them <laughs> of their sins. You know, just a few years prior, Jesus was in a house. And he's up in the north in Galilee, and folks are flocking to him. They've heard of his teaching, and they've heard that he has power to heal. And so the whole courtyard around the house is filling up. The doorway's full. Some friends come and bring their friend who's paralyzed on a mat or a pallet of some sort. And they're trying to get him to Jesus. But there's no way they're going to get through the door. So they think for a second and they decide they're going to climb up on top and they tear off part of the roof to lower him down just so he can get close to Jesus. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, my son, your sins are forgiven. <laughs> That's not even why they came. <laughs> he saw his deepest need. But of course, there were accusers there. There were some of the Pharisees there who already saw Jesus as a threat and a problem, and they were just looking for any ammunition they could, and he gave it to them. Because, of course, only God can forgive sins. And Jesus knows their thoughts. And so he says, which is harder to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, arise, take up your bed, and go home? 
but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He turns to the man and says, I say to you, arise, take up your bed and go home. And the man gets up and he goes home and everyone saw and they were amazed and glorified God. They'd never seen anything like this before. And that day the accusers were silenced. They had nothing to say. But on this day, there were more of them and they had plenty to say. They were mocking and railing against this man as he was crucified. They crucified the blasphemer, but they have no idea what they're really doing. They have no idea that he came to do this. He went to the cross willingly. His face was set toward Jerusalem. And it wasn't for the people that these authorities expected. It was for them. It was for them. It was for the conservative religious folks. For them. He came to forgive them of their sins, to purchase their forgiveness with his blood. Dear ones, your family member knew what they were doing when they took advantage of you. Your rival at work knew what they were doing when they said lies about you and threw you under the bus. Your ex knew what they were doing when they committed adultery and broke your heart. And you and I know what we were doing. When we sinned, we wanted what we wanted. But at the same time, in our lostness, man, we didn't know what the heck we were doing. We didn't know that the, the greatest betrayal wasn't against you or me. It was against the one through whom and for whom we were made. The one who in Jesus came to seek and to save folks like us. This one who was crucified. And so hear the heart of Jesus from the cross. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Amen. We're still in Luke 23, now in verse 43. The first word was a word of forgiveness. The second word, a word of welcome. Truly, I say to you, today, you will be with me in paradise. Jesus said, truly, I say to you, today, you will be with me in paradise. They were criminals. Jesus looked left and he looked right and he saw lestai is the word. It's rendered robbers sometimes, but they couldn't have been crucified for mere robbery. These were, in the old word, a brigand. These were, we might call, insurrectionists. The Romans might have even called them terrorists. Clear and present dangers to the Roman occupation in Judea. And, and what had they done? Perhaps they've, they've plotted the murder of a Roman official. Perhaps they succeeded. Maybe they've killed someone's father, someone's mother, a brother, a sister, a son, a daughter in the name of a failed political revolution. And maybe they even did it in the name of God and dragged God's name through the mud, bringing his name into disrepute among the nations. Jesus knew. He knew exactly why they were crucified. And in fact, they were there justly, unlike him. But one of the criminals, raging against his punishment and pain. Maybe he thought in his last moments he could get a tiny ounce of satisfaction out of belittling this ridiculous do-gooder from Nazareth. And so he rails at him, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But then something amazing happens. This other criminal, he defends Jesus. 
He's already humbled. He humbles himself further and speaks a word on Jesus' behalf. Man, we're here justly. We deserve this. This man, he's done nothing. And then he musters up the courage with that last bit of energy as he's dying. And he asks, Lord, remember me. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. No doubt he would have taken more mockery, more abuse from the crowds and the other crook. But this is his plea. Lord, remember me. And, and what is Jesus like, our suffering Savior King, enthroned on the cross? He says to him, truly, I say to you, today, today, and think about that day. It's growing dark in the afternoon, the darkest of days, suffering beyond anything we could imagine. On that day, today, you will be with me in paradise. It's amazing. Friends, criminals will be with Jesus in heaven. Unforgivable offenders, forgiven, declared righteous, possessing the righteousness of Jesus, the sinless, saving son of God. but many respectable people will not. And that's the offense of the cross, isn't it? And everything in us just wants to revolt at that idea. Well, it's just too easy. In fact, it's ridiculous, God. I mean, I'm a pretty decent person. I've never killed anyone. I've never launched an insurrection. I've never broken my marriage vows. I vote for the right people. I don't smoke or chew or associate with those who do. You know, I deserve, I mean, at least a little bit of heaven. Maybe that's in your heart a little bit tonight, if you're honest. Just offended at the gospel message that today a terrorist can be welcome in heaven through Jesus. If that's you, I could imagine Jesus speaking to you tonight if you were to ask him, how on earth could you welcome that kind of a sinner into heaven? He would say to you the same way that I could welcome you. There is no other path. Friends, there is only Jesus, the crucified one. He is the way and the truth and the life and no one no one, no one comes to the Father except through him. He alone, friends, is the way. He only came to forgive sinners too. The only category of person. He only came for the spiritually destitute. He came for the morally sick. He came to call the unrighteous. And so friends, the difficulty for church folk for God talkers, the difficulty, friends, is that unless we see our respectable sins as equally damnable as the rapist, as the terrorist, as the murderer, until we see that the wages of our sin is death, and that wage was paid in the blood of God in flesh. Jesus has nothing to offer you. But when you see, when you see it, when you start to see, I'm here justly, I deserve this, but he, he's done nothing, he's sinless and beautiful and true. When you start to see this, It'll rouse in your heart the courage to ask. It sounds ridiculous. It's a big ask. Lord, let me be with you forever. 
forgive me of all my sins. And what is this king of heaven like? He's not stingy. He lavishes the wealth of heaven. He says, today, today, here is welcome, friends. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Amen. Luke 23, verse 46, we've heard a word of forgiveness, a word of welcome, and now we hear a word of confidence. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Jesus had had the Psalms stuck in his head. What's been stuck in your head lately? What's on your playlist? Jesus, he had uh, Psalm 42 on his playlist in the Garden of Gethsemane. Now is my soul troubled. And then in his moment of greatest agony in the depths of his sense of abandonment, he had Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But now, having endured all of this agony, nearing the moment of death, he turns to confidence. With Psalm 31, verse five. It's like he's, he's changed from Louis Capaldi to like a Taylor Swift upbeat song. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He's confident. Though he's, he's felt that the father had abandoned him, he knows. Eternity had taught the second person of the Trinity well. The father is always faithful. He's able to do all that he promises. And so he trusts in the moment of death. He is ready to die and die well. Are you? Are you ready to die and die well. It's a strange honor that a pastor has that we get to sit down with dying people. Sometimes they're hardly aware that we're even there in the room. Just the things of sickness and life have ravaged their bodies. But then I'll sing an old hymn. I'll sing something like, this is my father's world, or how great thou art. And they almost rouse. They're almost back, they squeeze my hand. I'm whispering Psalm 23 in their ear. Surely goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. You're gonna dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I anoint their head with oil. An elder with me prays. We just try to muster up words. We lift our desires to God. We never know if we're saying the right thing. We're just asking God to help, to encourage, to bring the person through. We look up, I say a benediction, and then we go. But sometimes folks are scared. It's understandable. We're scared in the face of death. They've heard the words cancer or sometimes they don't hear any words, and that's the scary part. They don't know what on earth it is, but they know they're dying, and it's just the unknown. What is this? Sometimes it's Alzheimer's. Sometimes it's dementia. And on the other end of things, it's, it's a young person faced with a terrible diagnosis who's never even thought about death. <laughs> what do I do? Oftentimes, there's a real sense of shaken faith in these moments. I trusted something, but I, I don't know if it's there. For the secular kind of faith, you know, a person would say, I, I thought I was all right. I was fine. But now I'm not sure. What if there's something more and, and I'm not ready? Death makes us ask those questions, doesn't it? And, and for those who have trusted in the Lord throughout their lives, they come to this moment of death, and it's like, 
I've been saying the Apostles' Creed since I was a kid. I believe in the resurrection of the body. I believe in life everlasting. But right now, death seems so much more real than everlasting life. How do I believe when it just doesn't seem true? Maybe that's been you. Maybe that's been a loved one. How do we hold on? Oftentimes it's the anxiety. It's the pain of leaving someone we love. You know? God, I don't know how I can leave him. He doesn't know how to use his money. He's going to leave the wet laundry in the washer for days. It's going to reek to high heaven. <sighs> Lord, give him... Give him another wife. Let him remarry. I can't imagine him alone. But sometimes dying folks are strong, aren't they? Incredibly strong. They have this peace that surpasses anything that I can understand. You see, these folks aren't, they're not full of confidence because of their circumstances. You know, <laughs> in the midst of pain, in hospital gowns and sanitized rooms, having all the beeps and the pokes and the interrupted sleep, that's not what's giving them confidence right now. It, it comes from a life having experienced the faithfulness and the power of Jesus. A life of trusting the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit who has never left them and never will. They're depending on those promises they're depending on the truths of those Jesus songs. They've entrusted their lives into, into God's hands and come what may, they know they're ready to die. They are sad about the sad things because of course that's the only sane way to be in the face of sadness. Jesus showed us the way, didn't he? The shortest verse in the scriptures showing the incredible strength of our Savior. John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept. He burst into tears because he didn't treat death lightly. He didn't come to offer a trite band-aid for death. No, he came to plumb its depths. He came to drink this sour wine down to the dregs so that on the other side, he could enjoy it new, the fruit of the vine with the Father and with all of his friends, criminals, sinners, you and me who trust in him. That's the hope. He came to purchase that for you and for me, confidence. Folks who die with this hope, they know Jesus and Jesus has shared something with them that he knows from an eternity of love relationship. He knows the Father has got you. He knows you're gonna be all right because you're in his hands. So I ask you today, are you ready to die well? If you're like me, uh, I, I don't know. But Jesus died to help you. Jesus died to answer the question for you. Hear his word of forgiveness from the cross. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Hear his word of welcome. This day, friends, you'll be with me in paradise. In the day of the hospital room, in the day of the worst punishment, the most dark day, you'll be with me and hear his incredible confidence and let go of your life. Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Father, tonight, man, I don't know if any of us, we'll, we'll say it, we wanna say it. We're just so ready <laughs> by that. I don't feel ready. And so with feeble faith, we come to you, Lord, and we ask you to lift our eyes to Jesus, 
who died on the cross for our sins, who welcomes sinners, who graciously gives us confidence to walk through death and all that life throws at us because you're with us and you'll never let us go. Help us to take hold of that. Help us to live in that and strengthen us. Lord, you have a way of strengthening us right when we need it. You keep the grace that's needed for today. But every day and till the day you bring us home, Lord, we ask for this confidence in Jesus. Amen. On the night when our Lord Jesus was betrayed, we're going back in time to Thursday, our Lord Jesus took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he said, this is my body, which is for you, for disciples, for folks looking to Jesus in faith and trust, imperfectly, <laughs> but trusting in him. This is for you. Take this and eat it, all of you, in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, after the supper, the Lord Jesus lifted up the cup, and imagine seeing him do this. No one's ever heard the words of institution. No one's ever taken the Lord's Supper before. It wasn't called the Lord's Supper. It was Passover. But he says, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take this, drink it, all of you. The Apostle Paul adds that as often as we eat of this bread and we drink of this cup, we proclaim our Lord's death till he comes because death was not the end of the story. Jesus trusted in the Father who he knew would raise him by the power of the Holy Spirit and so he would rest on Holy Saturday in confidence, knowing that Sunday was coming. <laughs> but friends, I just ask you today, where are you with Jesus? Do you trust in him? Do you have a feeble and perfect faith like mine? Man, you are welcome to this table. Come and take and eat. Receive strength. Know the presence of God is right here with you, nearer than that bread in your mouth more sweet than juice. And dear ones, if, if you're not sure about Jesus, you like him, you're interested in him, but you're not ready to commit your life to him, to follow him, to trust him as your Lord, if, if that's you, hang back and watch and consider the Lord loves you. He loves you. That's what this cross means. That's what it means. It was out of his great love that he died for you and for this whole world. So consider that and don't wait too long because we don't know the day that the Lord has for us. Reach out to a neighbor, to a friend, to me, and, and we'll pray with you and walk with you and figure out life with you. But for those who do come today, uh, there is gluten-free bread in the middle. As we pass this around, you'll be able to enjoy that, elders, as you come forward. Um, the good stuff's on the outside. If you have uh, something that's just in your heart you haven't repented of, you need to talk to God about that. This is just a good moment to do that. If you have something that is in between you and another person, um, a spouse, a brother, a sister, a friend, would you just start the process of making amends? Would you just say a word, I'm sorry. Let's talk later. Shoot a text if you need to, somebody who's not here. Because this is a sign not only of our reconciliation with God, but also that we are a body, that we are united by his spirit as one people together. His life is in all of us, and so we want to show that when we come to this table. But I'm gonna pray, and then we'll receive this wonderful, blessed sign together. Father, thank you for this meal you've given us to nourish us in our hearts, to communicate your love and presence to us, and I pray that you'd make us ready to receive 
We need you, Lord. You are holy and we're not. You're good and true always and we're not. So we just ask that you'd strengthen us to see you as lovely and to share your loveliness in our words and ways as we go forward. Amen.